You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. Uh, We are almost to that wonderful time of year, which is April. And for most people in Northern Virginia and Maryland and up, that's really the sign of spring. If you're in down in Southern Virginia, you know, the pre-spawn is already completely on. Uh, I just fished the first time ever this past weekend, the Fountainhead Bass Tournament. Um, Absolutely great lake. We've all heard the rumors from the biologists, like it's the best lake in Virginia. It showed out insanely well. It's a weird format because you're allowed to bring six fish in, but still the the club record was broken with 36 pounds for six fish. I think the largest was an eight pound largemouth. We had 25 pounds for six fish. So the point is, even though it's a weird six six fish thing, even if you subtract one, those are some hellish bags coming out of that place. Uh, Absolutely a blast. We're getting back into the smallmouth. I'm trying to do better because I've heard people in the comment section about not stacking uh, kayak, kayak, and then small mouth, small mouth. I'm trying to go between the lakes and the rivers. And I want to head back to our roots here with some small mouth bass fishing, it's particularly the upper James, the section of the James and, and the Jackson that we really don't talk about. And we're bringing back a, a complete favorite of the show. I'm going to bring him on the show now, Rob England. Rob, how are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, I'm doing great, Thomas. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you so much for joining me uh, here for a Monday night live event. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm excited about doing it. This is the first time I've ever done a live event. So uh, it's going to be I think it's going to be great. Well, the audience here is very generous. And as always, guys, with this Monday Night Live, ask a good question. And if I pick it, you win a prize to Jake's Bait and Tackle or Tiger Crankbait. So please get those comments going. I know it usually takes about 20 minutes for people to kind of get get on in here with their busy days. So we're going to get the introductions out of the way first. Uh, you've been on the show a couple of times, but for people that are tuning in for the first time, just a little history. Like, how did you get into the whole guide service and how did you find the Upper James? Well, um, I, I grew up in Ohio. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an avid sports fan. Uh, played uh, football and hockey uh, growing up and and uh, fished a lot when I was a kid. And my grandfather had a uh, cabin uh, on a lake in Ohio called uh, Indian Lake. As a matter of fact, it, it got hit pretty hard uh, this past week by some uh, tornadoes up in, in the Ohio area. But at any rate, um, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was some pretty bad, uh, pretty bad weather out that way. But, um, so as, you know, as I was, as I was graduating high school, I wanted to play some more football. I was a better football player than I was a hockey player. And, you know, Ohio state is kind of my, my, that's my favorite, you know, my favorite school. And I, I just don't have the, 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 the size or the speed to play somewhere like at Ohio state. So, uh, one thing led to another and I was able to get connected to, uh, a place called Ferrum College uh, down here in, in Virginia, about uh, about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour from where I'm at now in Eagle Rock. And so I, I went down there as a junior college, uh, played a couple years there, football, got my associate's degree. But all the while, I started fishing the James River, uh, the Jackson, the Mari, uh, even the New a little bit, the New River a little bit. And uh, um, just, you know, it was just such a different world from what I grew up in in Ohio because you know, those man-made lakes up there are kind of shallow. Um, you know, and I caught a lot of different species of fish, but uh, I remember some of the guys that I worked with in the off season, uh, a place called Hills department store, um, is where I would, I was, I would be working during the, uh, the summer and the winter. And uh, yeah, man, you gotta, you got you ought to go up to, if you like to fish, you, you need to go up to the James river. You need to go to the Mar, you need to go to the Jackson. You can go out there and catch a hundred smallmouth. I'm like, yeah, come on. <laughs> you don't go out and catch a hundred smallmouth, at least where I'm from. And, uh, so literally the first time I went out, I caught almost a hundred fish Damn. and that was, that was kind of the beginning of it all. Um, I ended up leaving, uh, leaving this area, uh, going to North Carolina, uh, you know, got married, had children, worked for food Lion uh, in their corporate office. I was in supply chain for many, many years, but, you know, as the years went on, um, you know, I continued to come back this, this area and camp uh, with my, with my children, uh, during the summertime, uh, like June when they would get out of school. And, um, you know, I just started thinking about, you know, I, I, I've gotten, you know, I think good enough at this that, you know, I could probably guide and that maybe one day you know, I might step away from corporate America and, you know, do what I, you know, what I really love to do. And that's, you know, take people out and fish. 
That's freaking awesome. When when people talk about the James, I, I think, and this is something that I almost need biologists on to talk about, like def- definition of upper versus lower. Sure. I generally, for the, the layman, say the non-title versus the title portion. But then you yep. throw the Murray and the Jackson. H- how yep. do they work? In are they are they tributaries of the James? Is that how that works? Yeah. So th- you could basically consider the Jackson River as like the northeast branch of the James River. Um, so it comes out of, um, uh, well, it actually, it, it, it starts above Lake Mumaw, which Lake Mumaw and Gathright Dam was created in the early 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they uh, so the, you have Gathright Dam and then below, below there, basically you have about 18 miles of trout water now, wild trout water. And then once you get to Covington, it really becomes very prolific, actually, smallmouth uh, fishing. And so... It, it empties into the James right at the uh, right where the cow pasture comes in an iron gate. So the confluence of the uh, Jackson River and the cow pasture river create the James River, which that that is officially the the head of the James and the upper James. And that that essentially goes from Iron Gate all the way down to uh, Snowden, um, which is just slightly pla- uh, past Glasgow in Amherst County. And then uh, from there, you then have the middle James, which basically goes from Snowden to Lynchburg. And that's a Piedmont stream where the upper James is a mountain, a mountain stream. And then once you get below the fall line in Richmond, you're, you're more in a tidal uh, scenario where you have the lower James. So there's really three kind of three different rivers. But what a lot of people probably don't know is that the James River is the longest river in the United States solely within one state's border. Hmm. And then, and, then, wow. and then the Mari River um, starts up uh, in a place called Goshen's Pass. Um, it is is just a little trickle trout stream. They they stock it up in the headwaters. And the Mari River is about thirty five to forty miles long. Not a long stream, but a very productive stream. And it empties that into the James, so it's a tributary to the James, and it comes in right in the town of Glasgow. So whenever I float. One of my favorite floats, which is called Balcony Falls from Glasgow to Snowden, I put I actually put in on the Mari and it's just a little short turn and you turn on to the James. So the Jackson and the Mari are both significant tributaries to the James River, upper James River. When you talk about the Mari, um, and just for some of my audience that knows like the upper Potomac around Paw Paw or the Shenandoah, are we talking, is it as wide as like the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac up there? Is it bigger? Is it is it really a stream? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I have not fished those streams. I've been over them, so it's hard for me to really gauge that. Um, it's not as wide as the James in most places. Okay. Uh, I would say in a lot of cases on the Mari, we if if we are in the middle of the river, that with a really good cast, you can make it to both sides. Of, oh wow! Of the river, it has to be a good cast. <laughs> you know, not always, but uh, in most cases. Uh, you can you can reach both sides of the river. So, you know, I would say 40 yards across, give or take, maybe 50. That's freaking awesome. And we got two questions in here. And then, guys, if the, for the people on Instagram, we got about 20 people watching on Instagram right now. Head on over to YouTube because I can share your comment on the screen. Instagram and StreamYard aren't friends, but I will, I will I'll read it off now. Angling Outdoors IG says, is the Murray more for wading or kayaking or, or both? Both. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good places that actually have public access. Um, uh, there's a place called River Road that comes off of Highway 501, just just on the other side of Glasgow. And it basically bends uh, down around the Mari River and just follows the Mari River all the way almost into Buena Vista and then comes right back out on 501. And there are a lot of places along, you know, you just have to be careful, but uh, there's a lot of public access where you can go down and wade. Um, there's uh, there's a there's a boating access along River Road that is owned by the DNR, and eventually you're talking about maybe making that. Uh, you know they're going to put some gravel there, um, but you can float from there down to Locker Landing. Uh, you can put in at uh, 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 Glen Murray Park and float down to River Road, or you can cover if you want to cover the boat, that whole stretch. It's about 12 miles. And then there's a put in at Jordan's Point Park, uh, which is actually in the town of Lexington. And you can take out on, on, on uh, right above Route 60 
um, which is in Buena Vista. And you can't really go past there because mm. there's a fairly large dam there. Um, the, you know, I've heard them, you know, possibly taking that out. There was one in, in, in Lexington that they took out a couple of years ago. So they may end up taking that one out in Buena Vista as well. So there's three, four good, really good floats on the Mari. And then uh, Angling uh, Outdoor Adventure, uh, message me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. You just want a gift card to Tiger Crankbaits. We got another question here before we kind of get more into the show. Uh, Matt Miller on YouTube says, Matt Miller, how is the fishing around James River State Park? We went camping there last summer, but didn't have time to fish. Um, I believe that's in the Natural Bridge area, uh, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, actually, uh, very good. Um, now it's, it's not what it used to be. And I think I may have talked about this a few times, uh, on previous podcasts, but, um, mm -hmm. we had a couple bad spawns, 18, 19 and 20, uh, 2018, 19, 20. And then, and then there's a flathead catfish, uh, issue that needs to be addressed. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't have the prolific numbers, uh, in that stretch as we used to, um, but it's still, it's still a very viable fishery. Um, there's an access point, uh, a place called Alpine. So there's a big farm. Uh, it looks like something out of a movie, uh, Alpine farms, and you can put it in at Alpine farms and float down either, um, Jellystone, uh, uh, Jellystone park right there in natural bridge. You can take out right there, or you can go a little bit further. There's a place called wilderness canoe. A friend of mine runs that. And he, you know, sometimes so he typically, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, uh, uh, camping at his location, you can absolutely take out there. If you're not camping, you might have to get permission to take out there at uh, Wilderness Canoe. There, there was a photo um, floating around the internet um, from I think it was like Blue Ridge Muskie of an absolute massive smallmouth caught yeah. out of the Upper James. And I feel like if you don't live in the area, that captures the hearts and minds where this river is an absolute just slug fest susquehanna level there's tons of big fish and really want to kind of get to like where the truth is it, you know is it where is the smallmouth population in 2024 compared to years prior you know it, it i would it would be hard to gauge just yet uh to be completely honest with you i've i've been running musky trips just like like crazy since February. So I uh, haven't really got into the smallmouth yet. As a matter of fact, I just had my, I mean, I've been out scouting a couple of times, but uh, did my first official, uh, you know, guided smallmouth trip on Saturday. Wow. We did okay. We did okay. Um, not, not great, but, you know, had, I had a couple, you know, beginner fishermen. So that created, you know, some challenges uh, of, of itself there. But um, I, I'll, based on the, I, last year, I, I would say the spring's going to be very good. Um, you know, I think the last couple of years, the spawns have been good. Uh, the numbers have been good. I wouldn't say they're uh, prolific or terrific, but uh, we've got a lot of big fish in the river and we've got a lot of small fish in the river. We're just kind of miss, missing some of those in-between fish. Um, but I, I'm expecting a really good spring. Now, you know, the key to the whole thing is, you know, weather and water conditions. And right mm -hmm. now, uh, we have really good water conditions. So I'm um, keeping my, you know, keeping, keeping my fingers crossed that, you know, that's going to, that's going to continue for the rest of the year. When did, when was the flip where it really did become like the musky capital of Virginia, quote unquote? Um, was it always that way with the James or was it just over time it built that reputation up to where it is today? Yeah, it, it, it took, it took time. So, you know, there were some native fish here, but you know, they were rare. Um, and then there was a pretty aggressive stocking program in the 90s to really build the population. Um, but I would say in the last, you know, 15 years or so, I mean, it has really just absolutely caught fire. I mean, we, we're we running about an 80% success rate um, since Damn. February. Uh, I was out yesterday. We had to work really, really hard because it was, I don't know about where you are, but it, it's it's been windy. It was windy yesterday, yeah. windy today. It's supposed to be really wind, windy uh, the next couple of days. And, uh, we really had to battle that we finally we finally struck gold about uh about two o'clock and, and got a club about a 40 inch fish in the boat it's interesting i had ethan of new river guides and he talked about um the dwr surveys and about each river and he talked about like the james has like i, I it's like so many musky per acre and then he said like the new reg new river has almost too many now I, is that something that could ever happen to like the james like 
is overpopulation ever possible for muskie in general? Uh, that's a, you know, that's a great question. I don't know that I could, I could, I could answer that. Um, what, what concerns me a little bit, you know, and, and I think, it can, you know, any, any fisherman or guide is going to be concerned is, you know, pressure and, and, you know, overfishing. So, um, yesterday, um, uh, we were going to do one, one particular float. And as we were pulling up, there were already two vehicles there launching. And I told my clients, I'm like, well, I don't really want to fight, you know, fight for river position with these other two. Um, so we're going to go up river a little further. Um, so, you know, I think that's always possible. You know, I think everything kind of goes in cycles, you know, you, you know, just like, in, you know, in the nineties and the two thousands, we just had this prolific, uh, smallmouth. I mean, you know, big fish days, you know, and big fish. And then we had the fish kill in 2007 or 2008, you know, and then, you know, we've had, you know, some bad spawns. So, I, I think the same could go for muskie, but, you know, I will say the, the population is extremely strong. I mean, like I said, you know, we're running 80% this year. Last May, I ran 100% in the month of May. Um, you know, there's just a lot. And, and I'm not saying that's just because of my guiding. Um, I think, you know, the population's there. If you're in the right place at the right time, you got the right bait, you know, your success rate's just, just you know, it's going to go up. Yeah, it's just it's just insane to me because I, I never thought about that till Ethan talked about it. Where um, when he does smallmouth trips, it's like it's ridiculous, like how many like jerk baits you'll lose because there's so many musky. And I oh, never yeah. thought about that <laughs> from catfish. Like you, we've heard the things about like there's too many catfish in the river. It's like, well, I've never heard of an example of like people like oh, there's just too many musky. And I wonder if it's just their breeding where like they just and they won't overpopulate a thing because of how they behave, their fish behavior. They're, it's just not in them. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't say with certainty, um, for sure, you know, unless I talked to somebody, you know, in, yeah. in, you know, in the game and fish and, and got some, you know, direct information from them. All I can do is kind of speculate about that. You know, like I said, it's always possible. Um, and like, you know, it's just the last couple of years I've been, you know, I've been extremely blessed to have such great success and, you know, that great success, you know, in turn makes happy clients. <laughs> And then we got a couple of actually on topic here. We got a couple of uh, musky questions. J, uh, we got JP. JP says, "What time of year is best for a musky on the Upper James, and what are the preferred baits? Any certain hot colors or patterns?" That's a good segue to some of the baits that we have. And then, guys, hit the like sure. button, and it helps us out in the algorithm. Please, it helps. Sure. So, um, well, you know, it kind of depends on, you know, there's 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 really three good seasons. For musky, you've got pre-spawn, which you know will start, and that'll start in February, and that will run. You know, we've probably got about a week left. It, you know, I'm, again, crossing my fingers, hoping that we, you know, can make it another because I've got a couple more musky trips. So, right about the end of March, uh, right at the beginning of April, you know, they're going to spawn out, and we're going to leave them alone for the month of April, and then uh, typically the last week of April, first week of May through June, like I said, last year was just insane. So a lot of people like that post spawn, you know, to your point just a few minutes ago about, you know, losing jerk baits and, and stuff like that. They are very opportunistic during May and June because they're hungry. And, and I mean, we've caught them on crank baits. We've caught them on jerk baits. We've caught them on Ned rigs. And that's when a lot of people accidentally catch them. Um, you know, not, I mean, they'll accidentally catch them now too, but definitely in that period of time and and the other thing people like about post spawn is you know you have a t-shirt on you can have you know shorts on the weather's pretty usually pretty yeah. good you know february and march can you know that's that's for the you know got got to be kind of hardy to be going you know someday like uh me and a, a client went out uh, a couple weeks ago um before i went to spring training and it was 21 degrees <laughs> um and, and it wasn't even 30 degree and he had he had three he had a hit a follow and he boated a fish within the first like 30 minutes. Damn. Um, so that's not for everybody. Um, and then you've got the fall season. And usually, you know, once we get uh, into June and the water temperature gets, you know, around 70, 75 degrees, we're done for the summer. And then usually by the last week of September, it starts to come back. And, you know, again, keeping our fingers crossed that um, we, you know, this fall, we've had two straight years of really low water and it really hurt the musky last year. I mean, just the, the lack of oxygen, um, they were just really lethargic. But 
typically that is a great time, um, right? You know, from end of September, 1st of October, all the way to Thanksgiving. Um, and then, you know, there's the winter season, which I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that myself. I just don't want to go out there when it's, you know, 35 degree day, but you know, if clients want to go, we're going to go. But, um, so when is the best time? I'll go back to saying it's kind of look, it depends on what you're looking for. Now, pre-spawning is like really, really big fish, you know, fish of a lifetime type thing. Now they're not going to get any smaller in, you know, lengthwise in May, they're going to lose a little bit of weight. But, uh, you know, musky fishing is never easy, but it's a little easier, you know, in the post spawn, just because they're going, if you're in the right spot, and there's musky there, they're going after something. Um, and then in the, in fall, my theory on fall fishing, whether it be smallmouth or musky, is their attitude and behavior changes because mature fish begin to recognize that water's getting colder, the days are getting shorter, and they eat because they have to. And they just get a really nasty disposition about them. And, you know, they, they're, they're, they're angry. <laughs> so they're pretty aggressive in the fall. And, and, and then we got a couple more musky questions here, guys. So I'll make sure we get those answers before we, before oh, we segue again. Oh, yeah, go, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Go for it. All right. So I'm going to show this one bait here. Um, this is called a prime suspect. And, and I want to give a, a I want to show this example. Hopefully people can see it right there. This is a, uh, my buddy Dennis Perko that I've talked about several times, uh, he makes this bait. This is like a seven and a half inch. It's called Prime Suspect. Got a little curly tail on the back of it. But if you can see it here, I'm going to really put it up close. This bait has caught probably 10 to 15 fish. You can see all the teeth marks on it. I mean, they just absolutely crush this thing. And this size is one of the sizes that I really like for, for the post spawn. Um, this is about a seven and a half inch. And then here is that same bait. Um, which we're kind of using now and probably we'll go to in the fall prime suspect. And this is a, this is more of an eight inch bait and there's somewhere on here. Yeah. You can see right there. Uh, we caught a fish right there and got a chunk taken out of right. Oof. Yeah. Right. Right there where my finger is. You can see that. Well, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So uh different, different color. This is mad time. I call this guy mellow yellow. I mean, he doesn't really, he doesn't really um, name the colors. I just kind of make up the colors. Um, then there's, uh, he's got these jointed baits. This is called a grid search. Once again, this is the Mad Tom pattern. You can see this one also is a hammer to death. She's so, seen some wars. She has seen some wars. Yeah. Missing an eyeball right there. <laughs> got the eyeball taken out. Um, and then, so again, that's a good, uh, good size. And even the tail, the tail's gotten shaved off there. Um, so comparison to that, that's again, a good uh, post spawn bait size right there, set about a seven inch bait. And then, uh, it's kind of a walleye pattern, even though we don't have walleye in the river, it looks like a sucker too, but this is, uh, this is an eight inch bait. And uh, one of the things I may have mentioned before, but, uh, Dennis puts these tracking strips on these baits, which is real <laughs> cool. One for one, this helps, um, uh, if you get a snag, these, these baits are probably about a hundred bucks, give or take maybe 125. Um, so you can see this bait from a long distance, but it also, in the water as it's moving through the water you can track the bait and make sure it's tracking appropriately and then uh and then a couple glide baits this one this one's called uh this one's called the hitman um and it's got those tracking strips on it and painted like a, in smallmouth pattern um this is real i mean glide baits are just really really smoking hot right now um and then a little bit of a different uh, style but this is like a hog nose sucker right here which is uh, and, and maybe like a fall fish um, so you can see one of the things that you might notice in a lot of these baits, there's a common theme in colors. Yes. Green, brown, gold, orange. You know, for me, in my experience, those seem to be the best colors. I'm not saying they're the only colors that will catch, you know, musky, but uh, they seem to be, you know, really the ones. And then um, this will transition a little bit over into smallmouth. Um, Dennis started making these, uh, these little five and a half inch. Now we're going to use these for smallmouth this year, but you can even probably throw these during, during post spawn. But uh, we've got the, you know, we, the, he mimicked the, uh, the bandit, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. That uh, is a, a hmm. great square bill. Uh, it's a beautiful color. Oh, I love that yeah. color. Oh. Then, then again, the mad Tom, the, the brown and gold. I mean, this, this is just one of the best color patterns that we've ever used is the, the brown and gold. Again, this is a, uh, Kind of a little walleye pattern right here 
crown of gold. Wow. And this one, this, this one right here is uh, kind of like a, a bluegill or a rock bass a little bit, a little bit of a different shade <laughs> of color that we typically use, but I think that's going to be a good one. So that's some of my favorite baits that, that we're using for musking and, and, and even some smallmouth stuff there too. So much of it is glides and it's, I've gone on one or two musky trips back when I was younger and you had a lot of jigs, tubes, um, ribbon tail style, style swim baits. It feels like everything's now full glide. How much of it is, it's the flavor of the month, like the whopper plopper used to be. And yeah. how much of it is like, no, like legit, this is just all you should be throwing. Um, well, I, 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 I absolutely believe fish get conditioned to certain things. You know, I, I remember, you know, when the fluke craze was on, and I think that's still a viable bait uh, for, you know, it's drifting a fluke or, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, using it like as, a, as kind of a jerk bait. But um, I, I think that, you know, I don't think smallmouth for especially have seen many glide baits. And I think that's why it's gotten really hot for smallmouth is, you know, that's just kind of kind of new on the scene. Um, probably been on the scene for musky uh, for a little while. I think there's a lot of them out there, but they seem to to do really well and you know there's some different things that you can do with the glides i mean you can you know you can make that bait go a little slower you can make it go you know a little faster and a little more erratic um but i do think that i think it kind of goes both ways i think sometimes it's the fish get conditioned to it and then i think you know from a marketing standpoint i always say you know it's it's more about catching the fishermen than it is catching yeah. the fish so you know sometimes you know marketing you know, kind of will push a certain thing and, you know, it may or may not be good, but like, for instance, the Ned rig, I mean, you know, that there's so many different versions of the Ned rig right now for smallmouth, And, uh, but it just, it just flat out produces. And I think that's going to be a viable bait for a long time. Some have a longer shelf life than others. Yeah. It's weird. Cause I, I had a fun conversation about that the other day about like the Cinco just feels like no matter what in a thousand years, that sucker is not a fad. It's going to still work. And I, I do right. think there are those bread and butters. Like you can use those. Um, let's see. We had a couple more musky questions. We will bang out right here. We got yeah. Lance gray, Lance gray. Uh, do musky have a good top water bite or is there a good top water bite for muskies? There is, um, in, in, not, in, in my opinion, um, you know, it's like, it's like smallmouth. I mean, you can catch smallmouth on top water just about any time of year, but there's really a particular time of the year when it gets really hot, uh, for smallmouth, it's usually in that post spawn and the same thing for musky, you know, and that post spawn again, they're very opportunistic. Um, the waters, you know, you know, starting to, you know, increase in temperature and, and they're, they're, they're pretty active. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that May to middle of June, uh, once the, you know, again, about the middle of June is when we cut it off. So that, that six week period of time is a really good time for top water. And then probably, um, maybe that first week or two in the fall, um, when, you know, you're still kind of, you're just into, you know, the first week or two of fall, late September, early October, water's still, you know, fairly clear. Um, that's a good time as well. Lance, you just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Please message me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com, and I'll get that out to you this week. Uh, let's see. We had another one there. I think it was from JP. Let me make sure. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, there he is. Okay. Uh, does he throw any inline spinners for musky? I do. Um, not a lot, but uh, once again, I, I would, for the most part, when it comes to the inline spinners, um, is that's a, that's a post spawn bait for me. Um, that, that hmm. made a June timeframe. Um, you know, you could throw it at other times, obviously. Um, but I think that's the time that they, you know, again, being opportunistic, they will really hunt down a inline spinner. And I like, you know, something they, they call them double show girls. I've got some, um, uh, some custom ones. The guy, uh, I think I have a guy in Wisconsin that I get, uh, some inline spinners from, but yeah, I use some pretty big ones. And, and then, you know, sometimes we'll size down a little bit. Um, you know, as we get later into that post spawn and go with a little bit smaller one guys, again, hit that like button. It really helps us out in the algorithm to make sure more people find this show right now. We're up to 48 people watching. I know you guys are, are slow today, probably getting back from the water. Uh, we got, I'm just going to keep going through these questions to play catch up. Um, uh, he's right about, this is more of a statement. He's right about the glide base for smallmouth. No, hundred percent. That's catching on right now. Uh, bank nation hit that like button y'all. Absolutely. 
Uh, Cinco's will never stop producing. Oh, no, no way in hell. Cinco's, tubes, Ned Rigs, that stuff, it, as long as you live, they will catch fish. Uh, Brew Tank Outdoors. Did he say $120 a bait? I have a $300 glide bait that doesn't work for <laughs> shit I bought. So, yeah, that's, that's cheap. <laughs> yeah, this guy right here, uh, probably uh, this is the prime, prime suspect with that curly tail on it. Uh, I think this one was 150. Um, these these uh, these grid search right here, the, these multi segmented baits. I think this one's probably right around 125. And you know, to be completely honest with you, I mean, if I go back, you know, several years, I would have never ever in a million years thought about spending that kind of money on bait. Um, but these produce. I mean, you know, when you when people you know are, are booking you for trips, and you know they're paying you to get them on fish. If this is producing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, put out the money to, to buy these baits and, you know, and, and I'm also fortunate that he's, he's a good friend of mine. He, he lives like five minutes from me. Um, you know, we fish together a lot. So, you know, we get, we get the chance to go out and test these baits a lot. Um, and he will not, uh, sell a bait until he knows 100% that that thing is, is, is exactly right. And he stands behind his work. Dude, that, that, that is, oh, I love it. And you guys, man, you guys like the musky question. Shit, keep it up. If you guys want more musky people on the show, I I, I got contacts. I'll get them on there as well. Uh, let's see. We, I'm just going to keep going all through these. Uh, I'm a musky novice, and this is great information. Absolutely, uh, JP. Jonathan, uh, if you could, oh, this is a great, if you could only have one bait for musky, what would it be? And don't worry, we'll eventually get to the smallmouth fishing, guys. No worries. We'll skip this yeah, it's gonna, it, it's gonna be that prime suspect. I mean, here's here's you know the, a little bit smaller version of that, you know that that. Um, but this prime suspect right here for me, um, Ooh, pretty that's seven inch, um, man. And, and and you know I gave that example earlier. This one right here, you can see that thing's been just just annihilated. I mean, it. it I'm about ready to retire this guy right here because it's wow. just a, so be or or get it repainted completely, have it sanded and and repainted but yeah this this uh this hard bait right here it, it it and what's really cool about this bait right here is you can do while it it's just a straight on throw out and retrieve um if you have the tail back here if you turn the tail up like this the, the bait will actually have a, a a wobble as it's as it's coming in hmm. it's hard for me to get the right camera but it'll it'll kind of wobble as it's coming in if you turn the tail down like that it's just going to come straight in. It's weird. Sometimes the musky oh, cool. want it exactly straight, and sometimes they want that little wobble to it as it's coming in. We, we, you know, all you have to do is just take the tail and turn it around, and then you, you know, you get the tail turned down, or you can go like that and turn the tail up, and you get a whole different, whole different action in the bait. But yeah, if I had one bait, it's going to be this one right here. That's that freaking one, awesome. Either, either the either either the seven or the or the eight eight and a half here. That. yeah it, it's hard guys like with a lot of this stuff and this is just with streaming in general to just grasp size of some of these baits it's just it's insane how i don't know like i i, I was completely wrong about the whole glide bait thing because i truly thought the price and the size would be a barrier to entry and that would just it would keep it very niche completely wrong people really are just digging not only like they're okay with spending the money but they're actually gonna go do it a lot of people are committing to it which is fascinating to me Let's yep. see. Got here we go. One cast, one fish. Anyone targeting musky from a kayak down there? Any kayak musky tips, guys? In the chat, if you know, come on, comment. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I see them, um, but you know, I have I have a fifteen foot Rocky Mountain raft, so that helps. I can't, re I can't really speak too much to, uh, you know, anybody in particular that I know that does it. But you know, I have seen some people out there doing it how much success they're have doing it. I, I, I really don't know. The best tip I ever heard, which is a very simplistic tip for anyone getting a musky fish. And the number one piece of tackle you need is a net the right size net for controlling the yes. fish. And I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not a real big guy. I'm about five foot seven, 180. Um, I can stand up in my net. Um, <sighs> Good luck. It, it's, it's called a super slimer net. Um, and, and I learned the hard way that I needed a net that big, you know, I lost a couple of fish. Oh, uh, but they're, and I'm not, I'm not just promoting that brand. Yeah. Um, but uh, the super slime, it must be have a real thick slime on them. And that's a, it's, it's, it's a protective uh, slime for the fish. And, and those nets are designed to protect that slime on the fish. Plus it has a real deep basket in it. Therefore you can, 
you know, if even if you catch a really big fish, you can keep that fish in the water until you get the hook out of its mouth. Otherwise, you know, if you have a small net, you might have to hoist that fish in the, in the boat and, and then it becomes dangerous for the fish, especially as, you know, it gets warmer. Yeah. And that's very important. If you guys are trying to do this from a kayak or something like that, you really need a way to be able to control and handle the fish. Cause this gets into to Lance's question here, which is what, what is the average size of the muskie and the James? I mean, if you've never caught one before, these are big freaking animals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the citation size for a muskie is, is 40 inches or 15 pounds. And the better percent of percentage of our fish are 40 and above. I mean, we do catch, you know, fish, you know, in the thirties. Um, but I would say 75% of our fish are over, over 40 inches. So yeah, they're big fish. And our biggest one to date is 53, uh, that we caught last year. That's insane. Yeah. That's, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> it was a big fish. When is, and really just kind of like to put a bow on, on the musky talk is what is the efficacy or people's thoughts around fishing musky during the spawn and into the summertime? Cause I know that there's, there's, I'm, I'm, dabbling in the musky community because of the show there's some controversy over that correct well i i prob probably um i just know for me and the guides that i talk to we are all pretty consistent in the fact that once that water temperature gets you know right around 75 we're done um because what happens is you know musky you know they will fight you to their death they i mean they will give you everything they got that's why they're so attractive to people. Um, it's just a tremendous game fish. And they get, you know, just like humans, I'm a, I'm a runner. And what, what makes you sore from running is, you know, you, you, you cross your lactic acid threshold in your muscles. And that lactic acid comes out of your muscle, and then your muscles get real sore. Same thing happens to muskie. And you might land the muskie in, you know, July. Water temperature is 80, over 80 degrees. You turn that fish back and it looks fine. Two days later, it dies hmm. because it's it's exceeded its lack. You know, it can't re it can't replace that lactic acid because of the hot water. And as a runner, what what restores the lactic acid for me a lot of times when I do long runs is I take an ice bath. And you know they they don't have the ability to find cold water. They'll go deeper or maybe try to find a spring or uh, uh, you know a a creek or something that they can find cooler water and you know they you know and i'm not saying every fish dies if when you catch them in the summer that's yeah. that's that's not the case but you know is there controversy about it probably and you know if you if you if you hook one well you're probably going to try to catch it you know i don't know if somebody's just going to take a you know a nippers and say ah, i'm not going to try to catch that fish well yeah i'm probably, probably going to try to catch it but um we don't try we just leave them alone um and then, and, and the same thing goes for when I, when I have a pretty good idea that they've spawned, I'm not, I'm not targeting the muskie because, you know, I, you know, they're, they're going to be guarding the nest and, you know, and, and the, and the fry and everything. And, and I just think that, I think it's the right thing to do for me. And I think a lot of other guides feel the same way that we kind of leave them alone from, you know, that, well, probably a week from now until maybe the end of April, last week, April. Interesting, interesting stuff, guys. You know, guys, again, hit that like button. It really helps out in the algorithm. Um, we're gonna we got a great question here, which kind of like segues into smallmouth stuff from Travis Cyber. Travis, how often do you fish the Jackson? I've only fished where it comes into Muma, and we had a blast. Love fishing Muma. My grandfather helped build the the Gothright Goth Gothright Gathright Gathright Dam. Interesting. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um. Well, uh, I, I used, well, up, up there, I used to fish it a lot more this year. Uh, I am no longer, at least for now, um, advertising trout, uh, guiding trips just because my musky business has gotten so big and, you know, I can, I can be at the musky launch in five minutes. I mean, James River runs right behind my house. So people um, that aren't aware then the Jackson is primarily known as a trout fishery. For the well, yeah. So you've got from Gathright down to the paper plant, which is about 18 miles. And yes, it's 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 a very good wild trout stream. But from the paper plant down to um, you know where the, the cow pasture um, is, and especially like right there, at just just right kind of in the middle of the city limits of Covington, down to an area called Lowmore, and, and in that area, man, I'm telling. I mean, you. 
if you want to catch a lot of smallmouth, now you may not catch, you know, some giant fish, but I've had well over a hundred fish days on the Jackson. So wow, damn, yeah, I, I I fish it a lot. That's really cool. Yeah, because like, and that's like until I started talking to you and and Rob of uh, the James River Keepers. It's kind of like the new river vibe because you have a dam there and the lake is so deep, whether it's Claytor Lake or Muma, that water temperature up there is so much cooler than anywhere oh, yeah. else. Does that affect the smallmouth at all? Like from that portion, and you, as you get into the more of the warmer, lower upper P Potomac, uh, their spawning habits versus pre spawn up near the paper mill versus pre spawn down. And does that help you with your guiding? Because you can kind of move around. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can always count on the, you know, go the jackson so if the smallmouth have already spawned on the james and the mari i can usually go up on the jackson and it's usually five to ten degrees colder um up you know up, up that way and i can still catch smallmouth a little bit later and then they're gonna you know they're gonna spawn a little later and then the smallmouth will start coming back on the james so yeah it it, it kind of works out it kind of works out nicely it fills in the gaps a little bit that's really cool and, and so just kind of like then breaking that down for like the smallmouth guys what temperatures are you looking for just really to be go time baby for like pre-spawn smallmouth getting into the spawn what are you looking for once that water temperature hits 50 degrees man it's go time uh we're probably on the mari and the james probably 55 56 ish right now um and you know like i said i haven't run a whole lot of smallmouth trips just yet but some of my friends, I mean, one of my friends was out the other day and man, they just, they just were killing the big fish. Wow. Um, so I would say for me that around 56 to 58 is really the magic number um, for, for big smallmouth. I mean, you, you can, you know, get good weather, good water, 56 to 58 degrees. You're going to, you're going to, if you know what you're doing and, you know, know where the fish are, you're going to have a good, you're going to have a pretty good day. How does the water, I mean, not water, I'm sorry. How does the river fish comparatively to, and it, it could just be anecdotally, like the New River, the Shenandoah, like how 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 does it fish and how does it set up? Generally speaking, are they pretty much all the same? Um, well, again, I I've never fished the Shenandoah. Uh, I fished the New James, Mari Jackson. Yeah, I would say for the most part they do fish the same. Um, you know the. The, the the trends of the fish and how they move from pre-spawn to post-spawn and you know into the fall and where you find them pretty pretty common i mean if you if you know the movements of smallmouth and you go to you know all those four rivers i mentioned you're going to probably have success in just about all the same places uh on all the rivers um you know the the ledges you know one of the real key factors of all these rivers is there's a lot of ledge rock where you have, you know, you'll have a slanted rock and it breaks the current and you'll find, you know, big fish right dead smack in the middle of the river where, you know, largemouth typically you'll find, you know, around the banks and, and, and you know, and, and it's not that you won't find smallmouth around the banks, but, you know, I, some of the biggest fish we catch are, you know, in the middle of the river, deep pools, you know, and the and big, di you know, big, some, what some, some of the areas I call like potholes. So you'll be going along and you'll have about, you know, three or four feet average and all of a sudden you get this hole and you know you'll find a bunch of smallmouth and the thing too about and i might be getting off topic a little bit but the thing that i find this time of year too in pre-spawn is that fish have a tendency the smallmouth while they don't really school they have a tendency to bunch up this time of year mm -hmm. so if you happen to catch one or two fish put your anchor down and, and, and keep fish in that spot because it's probably going to be pretty good you need, uh, I, I, re I remember an example last year we were over on the mari and and uh, we were throwing a crankbait and guy caught two fish and I threw the anchor down and then we switched over to a jig, um, Ned rig. And I think he caught like seven or eight fish just out of one spot. I mean, literally 10 yards. I am. So, sorry guys, apologize. I'm like this uh, tonight. I'm just not good with direction, but I think the James is west to east traveling. And so I'm thinking with wind up here on the upper Potomac and even the tidal river, that wind blows the right direction. It's, sucks it just oh, it, it oh. makes it terrible oh can you yes. still fish it or is it like you know you're kind of dunsky for the day because it gets so chopped up yeah um i have found like well you know i was talking about yesterday i mean i was pretty fortunate right. i think that you know for us to land a muskie yesterday but um for one it, it, you know 
it, it makes it just really hard to fish in general if you have a really windy day because, you know, the wind is grabbing your bait and you're having a hard time really putting it where you want and really getting, you know, a great presentation. And then, you know, the fact that I have a raft and I don't have a motor, getting good boat position can be murder. I mean, I, I was so sore yesterday and last night this morning. I mean, it, it felt like I had been at the gym all day long. Well, I was at the gym all day long, basically. I was just in a different gym. But, you know, just, you know, you get a headwind. Um, so it, it, it kind of depends. I think once, at least in my experience, once you get that wind around 10 to 15 miles an hour, it gets really t- I'm not saying you can't catch fish, but it gets really tough. And, you know, and, and there's always that thing about, you know, so, you know, when, when it starts to get warmer and you have a warm front approaching and you kind of get a warm breeze, um, not like a, a, a gust, gusty wind. But if you get a warm breeze, that could be really good for fishing. Uh, conversely, you know, if you're if you get a cold front coming and you start having that wind come from the north or the east, um, you might as well just pack it up and probably go home <laughs> Dude, or not ha- go at all. Smallmouth and we all like. Everyone in the chat will probably give me anecdotal examples of this and hundred percent about smallmouth biting in, in, in muddy, murky water. Um, I do feel like they are sight feeders, generally speaking. And so when you go from a semi clear to like, there's some chop on the water, uh, how do they completely shut off? Or do you really just have to go to the chatter baits, like hot colored crank baits, and then just kind of work a couple of bites. And do you just completely get rid of like bottom bouncing baits entirely when, when you get that kind of turbulence, turbility, turbidity in the water? Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah. Are you, are you talking about from a wind perspective or are you talking about, Ooh, that's are a, you talking about mm. from a, you know, a, a water level perspective, you know, because you've had rain or, or, or both. You see, depends. that is okay. So going down this rabbit hole, I feel like with the wind, it's more of an instantaneous thing because water rising, it, unless it's a flash flood, you're going to have a couple of hours or days that that builds. So I'm really thinking from a wind perspective first, and then we can talk about like water. Yeah. So from a wind perspective, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be throwing crankbaits, um, spinnerbaits that, you know, something a little heavier that you can cut the wind through. And, um, and that will also, you know, create some vibration that, you know, cause the fish not only are sight, but they feel too, you know, they've got those lateral lines on their bodies and, and they feel that, you know, they feel by vibration. So they'll hunt, they'll hunt something down. That's got some vibration and some flash to it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty much in, you know, in a windy condition, I'm abandoning plastic baits and thus, you know, I might throw a heavy jig. Um, you know, like at the mouth of a creek or a spring or something like that. But generally speaking, I'm going to be throwing, you know, crankbaits and spinnerbaits and stuff like that. Now, what if the water's rising? Uh, man, you can, you can, if you catch it just right. Now, you know, the key to rising water is how, wh- how and where the water hits the watershed and how f- the, the, the speed at which the, the level comes up, you know, if, to your point, if you have a flash flood, you probably don't want to be out there. You know, that's yeah. painful. But if you get a rain to the fact that you start to see this gradual incline in the in the water levels, um, there, 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 there can be a real sweet spot in there where that water's rising. Because when the water rises, everything starts to move. Um, you know, your bait fish starts to move. You know, you, you might get, you know, you might get some type of, you know, some hatches and stuff. And so it's just. And it's in there, and I probably talked about this before, but it's in all na- it fishes nature to chase things. Yeah. And the fact that we had that really low water last year and we had a lack lack of oxygen, they weren't chasing anything. I mean, you had to put it right right there. But you know, when that water starts coming up, especially like to that example, if you have a long prolonged uh, 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 low water event, and then all of a sudden the water starts rising, from man, that that is go time. Because those fish are just waiting for that, you know. Oxygen's coming in, food food's moving, and man, they just you can really catch it really good. Uh, on the flip side of that, you know, let's say you have a you know you have a high water event, and you, you're going to get to a level that might be unsafe and it's not going to be really productive. But as that you come down the other side and the water starts coming down, um, there's this. I don't know how it is maybe where you are, but we get this kind of greenish color to the water that almost looks like uh, glacier melt. Interesting. It's, got, it's kind of a turquoise color. That's go time for me. When I see that, tur- not, not 
not on the brown side because you you know there's there's a there's a certain uh, timing there where it might be a little more brown than it is green. But once you get to little that little more of a green tint to it, um, man, I mean that is good for musky. That's good for smallmouth. And I'm like, I gotta go. <laughs> that's the time to get out there. It's it's so fascinating. This is why um, for you guys that did, I th I think it's still listed on the channel. We did we tried to live stream the tournament yesterday, and one thing that we made the comment of when we were fishing it is it was the water at the res was dirty and it was overcast for three hours of the day. A friend of mine was using a bright white glide bait and he worked this thing back to the boat and started to talk to me. And while the bait was sitting right next to the boat, four pounder blows it out of the water next to the boat. We get him in. Well, oh, later wow. in the day, he throws that same bait and a fish comes straight up, sees the boat and the bait and then boils at it and misses it. The only thing that changed though is it became bright bluebird out. And yeah. that little detail there, it, it, and then what he did, which I think was smart, is he changed to a natural pattern and he caught two more in the day. It's so subtle, but really those conditions can really play and you got to adapt immediately. Yeah, yeah. I, I like, you know, if, if the water's stained, I, I, I have a tendency to lean toward darker colors. Um, and then when the water's clear or a bluebird, I'll tend to go to lighter colors. And the bait we caught the muskie on yesterday, you know, had some flash to it, had some, had some wobble to it. And, uh, you know, we had, we, the wind did calm down a little bit. So when we finally did get that fish, the wind had backed off some, and I think that helped us too. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, like, you know, spinner baits, you know, it's got that, you know, they got the blades spinning or like a jerk bait that I like, um, like these, these Rapala, uh, these Rapala jerk baits right here. Ooh, pretty color. Yeah. And, and, and this thing, when you, you know, you got that erratic action when it jerk, you know, you're snapping it around. And as that thing does this turn right here, you start to get that flash from the sun. And that, that'll really, that'll really draw the fish in. And, and we're going to get to smallmouth baits here. And I want to, I want to get through all of them. But I, this one question that popped in my head, compare and contrast with all of your experience, just in general, musky and smallmouth, which one, perf which one will strike out at hot colors more often? It, it, it's classic with smallmouth that like you throw a chartreuse or pink, hot pink sometimes, man, they will just freaking attack it, which is interesting. Like are musky that way or do they prefer it to like look perfectly natural? Out here, I lost his audio there. Mm. Which kind of happens sometimes. So guys, what I'm going to do is I am going to... And all you got to do, uh, Rob, just log in and log, like log out and log right back in. It's no big deal. Um, while he does that, I can answer this one question. Where to go? I got another question for. It was particularly for me. Do 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 do. It was about the tournament. There it is. Okay, we're gonna be pulling that that question up here in a minute. So I'm gonna. So Rob just has to re-enter the chat, and then he'll be fine. So just re-enter the chat real quick, Rob. Uh, and then you'll be back up. But degenerate, uh, degenerate fisherman says, Thomas, how did you all end up doing Sunday? So we uh, we did actually extremely good in that tournament. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the weights up here because people have been asking about them. Um, and I, let me make sure I, I message old Rob. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, here we go. Um, log back in. Um, there we go. Smiley face. Perfect. Uh, so anyway, let me pull this up for you guys real quick. I have the weigh-ins for the top couple of teams here that I really wanted to show off. And then this was from the Res Tournament. Let me get the screen presentation here. And I'm going to show this off real quick. I see Rob is back in the queue, but this question came up. So here it is. So there we go. When it comes to the tournament weights and everything. I don't know if you guys can see that okay there. Um, but the winning weight for yesterday with six fish was 35 pounds. Number two uh, was 29.9. Stokes had 28.78, um, 27.59. And then we came in. Uh, they butchered the hell out of my last name. It looks like he had a stroke. But uh, 25.04 is what we had. Really great rates. And then we'll have a separate, uh, maybe live stream or something uh, later on to be talking about that. But we got him back up here. Sorry, so, somebody, tried to call, somebody tried to call me on my phone. And in the audio, just went, after the call, I you know I tried to say, and then I, I, I apologize for that. No, nope, no big deal. The power of editing when we re-upload this, uh, it, okay. it'll, it, nothing happened. Um, so we do have a couple of questions here. Let me get this. Let me go here. 
Uh, let's see how did okay uh, i did work on a red chatter bait on sunday during the super windy weather couldn't get bit on a jig or any bottom baits yeah I, when it gets to and this is other something big and this is where i do think live scope is cool from a fish biology standpoint it tells you their activity level and even on sunday early in the day before the sun came out you saw so much more freaking activity you saw minnows and shad moving around as soon as that sun pulled out especially sunday was hot at least where we were everything died everything went down and got compressed and i think that's something that some of those wives tales about the wind and the weather are true like when it's cloudy out they're hunting generally speaking when that sun beats out man they just they do they get tight to the bottom mm -hmm. um I agree, let me, I agree with that but uh yeah smallmouth baits um generally speaking this time of year what are you you had the jerk baits or anything else you like to throw yeah so um i'm going to show you three of my favorite crank baits right here and my my favorite one of all um this this little guy right here it's called the Bandit, Bandit Bait Company. And this is, uh, this is uh, the, the uh, crawled ad with orange belly. And we've probably caught more citation smallmouth on this bait this time of year than any other bait. And, and if I get it real close, it'd probably be hard to see here a little bit. But you can see some teeth marks on this bait. Yes. Muskie, muskie have grabbed this bait many, many times. Wow. And this one in particular uh, during, you know, how I talked about the post spawn and, and musky being very opportunistic. Um, we, we've caught our fair share of musky on this one right here, but that's probably my favorite go-to. Um, I think this one is a, uh, I think this one is a, uh, uh, Kevin Van Dam. Oh, I love that color. Yeah. And, and the, and the common thread to all of these is, you know, they, they look like crawled ads, you know, there's some crawled ad very, you know, brown and orange, uh, brown, orange, and gold. Um, but, but all of these are, you know, they're all, they're all square bills. Um, I don't typically use for the river. I don't use anything other than a square bill. Um, you see the bandit also had a, had a square bill on it and these run, you know, anywhere from three to five, you know, four to four to six feet. And then this one, uh, cotton Cordell has been around forever. Um, and, uh, I haven't used a lot of cotton Cordell baits, but, um, see if I can get this one where you can really see it well, but you can see this kind of got an olive green with an orange mm -hmm. belly to it um man we've we've really done well on that bait so those are probably my three favorite crank baits all run about the same um this time you know is is you know the water's still fairly cool you know we're we're just a kind of a slow steady crank um you know, we might pause it a little bit and then start it going again try you know some different things with it but um generally speaking just kind of a slow steady retrieve and you know it's the afternoon you know if you have a really warm day uh, you can probably speed it up a little bit in the afternoons. You know, if they, you start seeing them chase and get a little more active. So, uh, from a crankbait perspective, those are my favorite crankbaits. I showed uh, uh, some some jerk baits. One of the common theme that you'll see in my jerk baits is that a um, little bit of a different color variation, more leaning toward you know some blue and greens. And you can see how that that one also sun hits this one, um, and it it doesn't just produce you know when when the sun's Beautiful out color. Yeah. And these are, these are fairly large too. These, this one here is probably five inches. Um, and, and I like to throw a little bigger this time, this time of year. And, um, this one's a little bit more on the olive green side, but it's also got that, you know, little prism, uh, shimmer in it. Um, so those are kind of my favorite, uh, uh, crank baits. And then, um, and they got this little swim bait here too. It's not a glide bait. It's just kind of a swim bait. So, um, again, you know, kind of leaning toward that silver, blue, greenish color. Um, so those are kind of my favorites. Um, then, you know, I talked about these a little while ago. So we're going to, uh, this will be the first year that we're really kind of throwing these more. Uh, never really thrown them much in the past, but these are, these are glide baits. And I've got four different variations of these that we're going to, we're gonna, really going to throw here in the spring and the fall a lot. And just to reiterate, are, are those glide baits that you just held up? That's something that's at your website, correct? Uh, it's not on my website. He's eventually, we're going to do a hyperlink on my website. But yeah, you just go to per Perko Lures, P E R K O. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's got all these different variations of baits. I mean, he's even, you know, switching back over to Muskie. He recently made a bait called a Mega. Um, and it's a, it's a big, uh, it's a version of this bait right here. <laughs> I think it's wow. 20, I think it's 24 ounces. The thing looks like a, it looks like a whale thrown in thrown in the water. It's crazy. And and just just for clarity, because like somebody asked in the chat, could you hold this two that what that big one and small one 
uh, side by side just for comparison. Because uh, uh, you guys, so, you guys got to understand that these things are freaking massive. Yeah. Good so that's lord. The, that's the that's the musky hitman. And this is the that's the smallmouth. <laughs> Good this lord. Is, this is five and a half, and this is eight. Good lord. I love that color too. Like whoever is your the painters did a fantastic job. Well, it's the same guy that, that Dennis Perko. That that's the smallmouth pattern right there. Mm. Damn, that's really cool. Hold wow. it where people can really see it well. And then, guys, please go check out his website to get those ordered. Yeah, glide baits are extremely hot right now. Uh, you might want to get on that bite before everyone's throwing them. Then you don't have that advantage anymore. We got uh, Shane Flint Outdoors in the chat. Howdy, bud. Uh, guys, go check out his video on his YouTube channel. He just dropped a Dirty 30 on Hunting Run Reservoir in Virginia. Uh, absolutely gnarly video. Uh, we got Gary Fishtails. Good evening, Thomas. No smallmouth or muskie here in Florida, but used to fish for them when I lived up north. Well, Gary, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. They have an online presence. So, yeah, go shop with them. Get some baits for the old tarpon fishing, for shooting alligators, whatever you're doing down there. Um, as as we move closer to uh, that, that late, that late pre-spawn into the spawn time, when are you going to really start working on bottom bumping presentations? When is that going to become more of a factor in your repertoire? Well, I'm I'm doing that now too. Okay, uh, but yeah, it will it will probably become more prevalent um, as we move into you know the latter part of pre-spawn and then of course post-spawn because you know as you get into you know June and the summer months, your wa your water is going to get um, clear and and lower, and you really have to start you know with more of a finesse presentation. Um, not, not that we won't throw any, uh, crankbaits, but, um, we're going to really start that switch over, but the, the kind of this time of year, what I'm, what our approach is, we'll throw a crankbait or a jerkbait. And those are what we consider search baits. So you cover a lot of water, you can make a lot of casts, you know, and, you know, you're just covering a good portion of the river. Whereas, you know, if you're throwing, you know, a Ned rig or a jig or something like that, you know, you're really, you know, having to, you know, it's very slow and you're not covering as much water. So, if we find a, you know, uh, a group of fish with, you know, that I, 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 I reference as a wolf pack, um, sometimes, and you hit a couple on a, on a, on a crankbait or a jerkbait or something like that, then that's a good signal. Like, okay, there's probably a handful of fish here and we'll have, we'll have a, uh, a jig or a Ned rig or something like that then to throw and try to see if we can really, you know, pick up some numbers in, in a particular area. We have a great little question here on the Instagram thing, guys. As always, like I said earlier in the show, uh, Streamer doesn't let me sh share questions from Instagram, but we got, what are what is a good fly pattern this time of year for smallies? You know, we don't do a lot of fly fishing. We do a little. Um, uh, I When I do fly fish, I mean, you, can't, you just can't go wrong with a woolly bugger. Um, you know, brown, green, black, that's a great, a great color. Um, and then... Uh, a lot of people around here have heard the name uh, Blaine Chocolate. Uh, he makes uh, a, a bait called a Game Changer. It's an articulated bait. I don't have an example of one, but uh, the Game Changer, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like one of these jointed lures right here, but you know, in a in a fly, where you know has a lot of movement as it's going through the water, and 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 those those for me are are, are good smallmouth patterns. And then of course, when you get into the summer, you probably going a little bit more on you know on the popper side like a sneaky peat or you know some type of a popper but you know I, I, probably about five percent of my trips are fly fishing trips not that we don't do them we just i just have a lot of conventional fishermen that book trips compared to fly fishermen mm, that's freaking awesome and then we got oh, we got let's see we got a couple more comments here. and then guys make sure you get your questions and i want to make sure we get everyone's questions answered uh before we finish up here we have passed the one hour mark um let's see and then as always guys uh we do for these uh Monday Night Lives, the uh, next two people to sign up for Fishing DMV Patreon will receive a bonus gift, uh, help us in all of our things. We have a new video coming on about that in the direction of the channel later this week. And we got one from Aaron Coons. Aaron Coons on YouTube says, do you have any horror stories about your gear, like giving a novice a bait caster because they said they knew how to use it? <laughs> um not not so much on, on like on a bait caster but i i do remember one thing i always remind my my clients of and it's just kind of a it's kind of a little pet peeve i guess of mine but you know when you're going down the river you're going to be 
you know, be in some fast moving water at times. I mean, there's some places that I fish have some class three rapids and, you know, I, and when it's happened, it's happened a couple of times, not a lot. Um, and it's never been intentional, but people will just kind of lazily hang their rod over the side of the boat and, you know, their, their blur will be sitting in the water. And there was a couple of times where, you know, I, I, I forgot to mention, Hey, you know, pull up, pull your rod up out of the water and get it in the boat when we're going through some fast rapids. Well, I remember in one case, the lure got stuck on something, you know, a piece of wood or rock or something and just snapped my rod. Lost the, yeah. Lost the bait and lost the, and that's happened a couple of times. Um, uh, I, I did have somebody one time that, uh, got, got uh, a lure, a lure stuck on the bottom of the river. And, you know, I always, you know, I always say, Hey, you know, open up your bail and let me get, you know, position the raft. A lot of times it's just getting to the right angle of the bait and it'll, it'll come right off and pulling and pulling. I'm like, Hey dude, you gotta, you gotta loosen up the drag there a little bit, open up that bail. And it got real tight and the whole rod just slipped. Everything went out of his hand and went to the bottom of the river. <laughs> Lost the whole thing. <laughs> like, and, and we really talked about a lot of glide baits today. It, as a guy, it's one thing if you're like an individual or you're fishing tournaments trying to make a living content creator, but you're a guide where you got to give tackle away. And I've heard an argument on both sides of the fence of like, well, I only want my people to fish quality stuff, so I'm going to buy that. And other people are like, I don't know if I want to spend on all just mega bass jerk baits because I lose four of them. I don't make any money on that trip. So how yeah. do you, how does that work into the whole guiding thing? <laughs> well, you know, on, on the bass stuff, I don't worry too much about it. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this little guy here in a minute. Um, this is, this is a micro finesse jig, um, made by Z man, peanut butter and jelly. I mean, that, that, that mm. we've caught more smallmouth, more citations on this bait than we've caught on anything else. Yeah. But as a whole, that whole setup right there is probably $2 and 50 cents, $3. You know, if you lose a bunch of those, yeah, it adds up. But one of these guys, um, I, I, and I hate to have the conversation with my clients on these, but I do that if they are negligent with one of these baits, like throw it up 30 or 40 foot in a tree, then I'm going to ask for restitution on the bait. But I think it may, it does create a little more caution for them. Fortunately, it's only happened one time. So, you know, and we throw a lot of these, but the other thing about using these baits is, you know, I'm using a uh, hundred pound, uh, 80 pound braid and a hundred pound fluorocarbon leader. So, you know, you can put, you can put in, in my rods are, you know, really heavy duty. So you could put some pressure on these and, and they come loose a lot easy, uh, more easily than some of these other baits. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's never been horrible. I mean, you know, there's sometimes you have some novice people that are, are going to lose some tackle, but, you know, you have to really factor that into your whole price of doing business you know, in terms of, you know, what, what you're charging. So, um, you know, I kind of keep an eye on my comps and, you know, try to stay pretty equal with them, but, um, uh, you know, within reason now, you know, I do, I do require folks that come fishing with me, sign a participation waiver. Um, so it, 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 it outlines being negligent with equipment. So if somebody's negligent with a rod or, or they somehow slice, you know, a hole in my, my raft or something, because they were doing something they shouldn't, then we're going to have a, we're going to have a conversation about some type of restitution. But, you know, that's never, fortunately that's never happened on that side. Um, I did have a guy, uh, had a young son with him one day. It was really hot and um, the son was in the back of the boat. So I wasn't, you know, the way my boats set up, I can't really see behind me all the time very well. And the kid got bored and he just was kind of in the back of the boat and he was taking the rod and he was just kind of, slapping back uh, the, the water and uh he was probably 12 or 13 years old i just heard him say uh oh i'm like what happened he said oh i just dropped your rod in the water and we were in a pretty deep hole so you know i asked his dad i'm like hey you're gonna you know you're gonna have to reimburse me for that rod shouldn't have been doing that mm, that's yeah. freaking dagger yeah yeah was, but two hundred dollars like you know two hundred dollars you, you can't you know that that'll add that'll add up that really does freaking add up um <laughs> dang that is freaking insane when it comes to citations and i think like let me see this uh lance gary has a really good question here uh yeah if i fish this if i fish the james from scott's uh down to cartersville um 
there's a lot of citations. How is the size in the upper James? So, and this is kind of like segues back to something that we said earlier. Like generally speaking, is it more of a volume place for smallmouth versus the size, or what is it like? Uh, that I I think that question. I think the answer to that question is it's more about the time of the year. Mm. So right now, it's about size. When we get into you know from now until they spawn, when we get into uh, post spawn, you know which will start week or two before memorial day and you know of course run you know into the end of june and then you, then you have the summer months then you're really talking more i mean you're talking about more about numbers that's when you can you know if all conditions are right you know you can get 70 75 fish you might get a couple big ones in there you know like in the early morning or if you're fishing later in the day you know late in the evening but generally speaking the size of the fish you know in post spawn probably going to run you know 12 to 15 16 inches and you know you might even get some smaller fish Right now, I mean, like the guy I was talking about that fished, he fished Saturday, Sunday as well. Well, I was fishing musky. He was over somewhere else fishing small, but I think he said they caught 15 fish and there wasn't one fish under 16 inches. I mean, they were all just quality fish. And then once you get to the fall, then you start getting into those quality big fish again. So it's, I think it's not necessarily about geography as it is more about time of year. Hmm. Got right on, guys. I mean, I learn something every time I do this. Uh, we got we probably will be the last question until somebody gets a beat, uh, one in under the buzzard. Gary's fishtails. Uh, I like the turret idea on the end of a jig, a finesse jig. Uh, sometimes they don't want a lot of action to that bait. I'll keep that in mind. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that little that little uh, Z Man micro finesse jig right there. Um, this is a one eighth ounce. I like to use the lightest that I can on this. But, you know, I, I have just, you know, fished the plain TRD, you know, just like that. Um, but these tentacles right here, you know, you can, because that's the way it sits in the water, you know, it'll drop on the bottom and it's going to sit like that. And you got that tail. Yeah. You can dead stick it and that tail is going to wag around. And then even these the tentacles are going to wave around in the water and you don't really have to do a whole lot with this. But when I, when I started adding that, uh, or I, I went to this micro finesse jig, and I added that TRD to it, man, it changed everything. Yeah, that's I like think a it, Ned, that's a Ned rig on steroids, right there. Yeah, that's a Ned rig on steroids or Ned rig in a dress. Um, <laughs> when do you pick though from going with skirt without skirt? Because it, it, you're right, that secondary action is important. Is that something yeah. that you just always do now, or is it very situational? It's almost something I always do now. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I haven't mean, fished the play, playing Ned rig. I mean, it's not that we never do it, but uh, it's, it's very rare. I mean, it just it produces all year. I mean, pre-spawn, post-spawn, fall. It it's the best bait of everything that I've showed you that, that that for me and my clients because it just it just always produces. That's really cool. And then, guys, this might be the last question of the night here from Shane Flynn Outdoors. Do you track how many citation fish your clients catch each year? Um, not not necessarily. Do I have a list or anything? But you know. Uh, I would say on average, I ran a, I think I ran a total of 115 trips last year. And, uh, we probably boated smallmouth. We probably boated 20 to 25 citations. Damn. I don't know exactly, but musky. I mean, like I was telling you earlier, you know, I, I, I actually ran more musky trips last year for the first time in my career than I did wow. smallmouth trips. So it was probably 60, 40 or 55, 45, somewhere around there. But I, I, I lost count of how many citation musky. I mean, like I said, 75 to 80% of them were over 40 inches. <laughs> Dude, that's freaking awesome. Um, it, Rob, I mean, thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and chat. Thank you guys so much for all the great questions as always. Uh, link in the episode description about everything we talked about. But again, Rob, if people want to book a trip with you or, or, try to find some of those awesome glide baits, where, where can they go? Yeah. So if they want to book a trip with me, they go to my website. It's uh, app bronzeback, adv.com. So it's basically an abbreviation for Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Um, you know, my phone, my phone number is listed on the website. Um, and my, uh, my Gmail, you can reach me at Gmail, same app bronzeback, adv at gmail.com. I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook as Rob England because I post other things, you know, a lot of sports stuff on there. But Rob England is a lot of fishing stuff on there. I'm on Instagram 
as Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. I'm on LinkedIn as Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Um, so you can reach me, you know, any, any of those different ways. Um, and then as far as the Perco Bates, uh, his name is Dennis Perco. Now, he, he does not have a website yet. He's in the process of a website. Uh, he does most of his stuff on Instagram under Perco Lures. Awesome but stuff. if somebody if somebody wanted to get in contact and with him and couldn't, I mean, I talk to him every day. Rob, again, thank you guys. Thank you so much uh, for coming on today. He's a really busy man. Go book him up. And if you're going to do musky trips, I'm going to assume do not wait for the last minute. Musky trips always book up big time. So give him a call and figure out what he's got going on down the pike for that. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out in the algorithm. Go check us out on Patreon. Uh, we're going to be dropping it here. When we hit 600 Patreon subscribers, we're going to be launching our nonprofit. We are allowed by the state of Virginia and Maryland to do supplemental stocking. So we're going to be trying to attack the smallmouth situation in our states and also anywhere else that we can help out the fishing world. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.